All right, everybody. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, officially we can get underway. Um, so it is my privilege to uh, welcome our guest this evening. Uh, so many of you already know him, uh, and I feel like even though he and I have never met directly, uh, he designed our staff t-shirts. <laughs> so uh, the, the karma trolling seal, or the, the karma trolling uh, logo. And so we've been wearing him for several months now. Uh, Jack Nyland was among one of the earliest students of the Vidyadara in North America. He received a wealth of first-hand Dharma art instructions and helped uh, create many of the visual elements of Trungpa Rinpoche's presentation of the Dharma in the West. He taught visual Dharma at Naropa from 1974 to 1989. Uh, Jack has taught and led a number of Dharma art weekends and happenings in New York City and around the country. More recently, he self-published a children's book inspired by Trungpa's teachings. Uh, he continues to live in New York City working on Dharma art projects today. Yeah. Mr. Nyland, it is uh, a privilege to have you here and we are just looking forward like crazy to hearing what you have to say tonight. Uh, so uh, please, uh, please address us and we'll spotlight your video here so we can all see you. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, today, I'm going to do something I've never done, which is sort of let you in on why I really love Trungpa Rinpoche. <laughs> it's going to be a bunch of really crazy magic stories. I'm going to confine it to what happened in 1970, uh, the five months of 1970. I arrived there at the very beginning of August in 1970. But as I'm going to reveal to you, Trungpa Rinpoche was a totally magical being. And things happen that make no sense. Even my arriving there makes no sense of how I got there. So I'll do a little flashback, tell a whole bunch of stories that include painting the door and all sorts of other things. I've never talked about this, but this is really why I love to be involved with Trungpa and Buddhism in general. I'm a terrible uh, you know, student. I've done all the things you're supposed to do, but that's, what not, that's not what kept me going. It's the crazy magic stuff that happened every day. You'll see when I tell a handful of stories. But I had to confine it to 1970 because I have 50 more years of stories I could tell. <laughs> I could talk like this for a whole week and tell you things. Okay, but to um, put it in perspective, this is all about the Dharma art teachings. And uh, my um, muse here, Alison Pepper, will now flash the uh, list. Right. I'm going to jump right in. So in order to do a proper Dharma thing, I have to put things in context and give you some actual teachings before I get to the good stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. So bear with me. This is doing the homework. Whoops. <laughs> Can you see this? Not yet. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. It was working a minute ago. Well, this is a list uh, that I got from uh, Tenzin Wangyal. It really made sense to me when I, um, there we go, is that on? Yes, now we can see it. Okay. Uh, Tenzin Wangyal is one of the heads of the Bun lineage. And just to let you know, most of Shambhala teachings are based on Bun teachings. Bun came before Buddhism by about 20,000 years. Um, so this is a list that kind of is really good for explaining what Dharma art is. Then I'll get to a diagram that Trungpa did for me that even condenses, makes it even simpler. Okay, so we'll just go through this quick. Vision is mind. Mind is emptiness. 
emptiness is luminosity. Luminosity is union. Union is bliss. And then I asked Tenzin Wangyal, what is bliss? And he said, bliss is manifest. And then he said, oh, you must be a student of Trungpa Rinpoche's, because that's a Dharma art question you just asked. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, manifesting means anything from a smile to opening your fan to inventing a whole city. So that is what Dharma art is. It's the uh, summation of all the Buddhist teachings. Trungpa called, you know, said this is his version of Zagchen or Mahaati teachings. He just called it Dharma art to kind of play with people. Uh, and then I added at the bottom manifesting his vision just to make it circular. Okay, so I, I don't expect to talk about this or it's just putting this into your head that Dharma art is the fruitional teachings. As Trungpa said, everything is Dharma art in the end. It's all about creating your world with your mind. Okay, so the next one. Okay, so now when I was teaching at Naropa, suddenly Trungpa was going to take over my class for a week. Uh, the mind body. So I asked him, I said, oh my God, you're going to be there. What is the essence of Dharma art? What is it really? And this will amuse some of you. First, he drew the uh, square at the top divided into nine. And he put X's in there. And he said, this is Buddhism, like a mandala. It's about emptiness and the feminine principle. Then down in the lower left, he put that little square and he said, this is tiger, lion, Garuda, dragon. That's the Shambhala teachings. Then he made that diagram in the circle where he combined them all with that cross, that means combining. And he said, when Buddhism and Shambhala join together, it creates Dharma art. So that answers all the questions about should Buddhism be combined with Shambhala and all that stuff. So that is his version of that list that it gave you. All right, so I'm just trying to say Dharma art is Trungpa's fruitional teaching. It's his Zogchen or his Mahaati. And as he said over and over again, at least to me, I wish he said it to a few more people, <laughs> that uh, everything he does is Dharma art. Forget about Buddhism and Shambhala. Everything is about creating your world. All right, now let's get to the fun stuff. I hope that <laughs> confused everybody and you can think about it another time, but that was the uh, homework part. <laughs> yeah, close it. And um, okay, now let's jump in and I'm gonna tell a story. And then we'll do some background, you know, we'll go back in time and forward, but this is like a movie now, we're switching gears. It starts out, this movie, I'm sitting on a toilet. Now the question is, where is this toilet? <laughs> it's in a outhouse, an old weathered outhouse. Where is the outhouse? It's on a pier a very long pier. And the pier is in Cape Cod Bay. And the pier is attached to the very tip of Provincetown. Now it's early morning in the first week in August in 1970. And I'm sitting in this, on this toilet. Why? Because life had turned into this total bummer and I was just wondering what to do next with my life. A little more background. My girlfriend and I and this famous photographer had just swapped uh, his very palatial studio, photography studio, for a car for one month. This person wanted to live in the studio to see what it was like. And we wanted to go on a road trip, a classic 
70s, 60s style road trip on a two lane blacktop. And we had chosen Route 5 that goes all the way up through Vermont into Canada. But first we wanted to stay, stop in Cape Cod and Cape Cod that year was a nightmare of hippies and druggies and bikers and cops and it was just awful. So our, we started out as a disaster on our vision quest. We wanted to <laughs> see what would happen. You know, Jack Kerouac uh, on the road, all that romance about two lane blacktops. Great movie came out that year. Um, and it was awful, our first experience. So I was, had wandered it down this pier and was sitting on the toilet just to get away and think. Now, suddenly, a beam of light comes through one of the cracks in the outhouse. It travels across the floor. And in front of me, I see a bright copper penny. Now, I had, me and my girlfriend had lived prior to this in California. We hitchhiked across America, another vision quest. We ended up in San Francisco for the summer of love. Haight Ashbury did it all, Acid, the Grateful Dead. And in part of that was learning about the I Ching and tarot cards and the zodiac in order to be a good hippie. <laughs> which I was. So I took this penny and I realized if I flipped it six times, I would get a very simple I Ching. So I started the, and then I could figure out what to do next with my life <laughs> and this road trip. So I start flipping the penny, comes up heads, 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 heads. And if you're familiar with the I Ching, that means number one, the creator. So here we sh show. Oh, whoops. Okay. We'll go back. There you see it, the creative, masculine energy. Really important to me, being an acid head hippie. I was blown away that this happened. So I immediately go to the, my famous photographer and my girlfriend, and I say, wow, this is so cool. I've got to, I'm going to call my sister Nancy, who just called me, <laughs> uh, and she's really cool, and she always knows what's happening, new agey, and she was working for an architect. Nancy says to me, my best friend, who lives next door, Olive Colon, who some of you may remember, just told me that the Dalai Lama has moved to Barnett, Vermont. <laughs> and we're like, whoa, <laughs> Olive. And the architect's name was Harold. And just as an aside, Olive, of course, moved to Karma Chilling, and she became the retreat master for many years. She helped with the Vajra Yogini Sadhana, et cetera, et cetera. And Harold, the architect who was married with kids, he dropped out, became a monk, and to this day he is still one of the main architects for the Dalai Lama. All of this because I found this penny, you know? <laughs> but this is, I'm already entering into Trungpa's mind. I know it. Because he told me, Buddhists can travel backwards in time and plant seeds. And I am convinced that these kind of things were happening. Okay, so go back to the floor. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show this. This is my version of being on a road trip. <laughs> so that's me <laughs> and my friend. Okay, let's go to what's the next um, site. Oh. Yeah, let's all hold on. Okay. Um, okay, so now we have to, so now we're heading towards Vermont because Olive said the, the Dalai Lama lives in Barnett, Vermont. Do you want the phone number? And I said, if he's really the Dalai Lama, he'll know we're coming. 
We don't need a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we start out. Uh, on the way, we see a, a young girl hitchhiking the other way. We stop and say, we're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, come with us. She's like, okay. So it's a truly happy road trip. Carefree, having fun. Now, I want to go back in time to set up what my first meeting was like. Because it's good, when you meet a guru, it's good to have things to talk about. You know, otherwise you're just, hi, how are you? <laughs> so here's a little backstory. And I'm convinced that this had to do with Trunkpo set planting seeds. When I was a young boy, around 12, I would say, I, I basically in the suburbs of New Jersey, it was a nightmare. I spent a lot of time in the old attic of the old house we lived in. Now, one day, uh, I was lying in the attic, okay? Picture this. Picture this. A fan, a fan, and the flesh. Behind the lamp. Uh, I was lying in the attic. It's around afternoon. There's a beam of sunlight coming through the trees. And there was a big box fan in the window. It wasn't plugged in, but it was like this kind of setup. Picture this is the sunlight, okay? And this is a fan. And it's hitting my eyes. My eyes are closed. And the wind is blowing the fan ever so slowly. So it's clipping the sunlight like a stroboscopic effect. And I'm feeling it on my closed eyes, the beam of sunlight. And suddenly, my eyes, with still closed, explode with geometric diagrams that are razor sharp in the brightest colors you've ever seen. You can go to the, the funny spinning wheel. And uh, I see these brilliant colors and I see concentric circles and spirals, five-pointed stars, checkerboards. Every time the speed of the fan changes, I see different diagrams and it just blew me away. It was so, I could get the, it would go 360 degrees all around me. And then I spent years trying to research this. Of course, how do you do that if you're a 12 year old kid in New Jersey? <laughs> but I kept doing it and seeing closer and more diagrams and more patterns. Okay, so that just became a huge thing in my life. Now let's flash forward a few years where I meet a scientist at Cornell University. I'm still in high school. And the scientist, Dr. Frank Rosenblatt, is, uh, he is working on the first artificial intelligence machines at Cornell and with sponsored by the US Navy because they figured they can get a weapon out. <laughs> so Dr. Frank has me, I used to go up and visit him. He was running like a hippie commune as well as being a scientist. And Dr. Frank was doing these experiments on vision, how vision works. And he would wire us up with all the wires and all the electroencephalograph things. And we would look at postcards of different paintings, and he would get brain reading. Uh, I failed to mention that we were often on acid, provided by the US Navy. <laughs> so I, we're looking through hundreds of these pictures. It's all the kind of the same brain reading. Suddenly, he has a black and white postcard similar to this. 
and the readings go through the roof, bang, bang, or to a much higher level of consciousness. And I'm like, Dr. Frank, I had told him about my visions and all the, the fan and all that. And he, I said, Dr. He comes running in the room and he says, what's going on? The machines are going crazy. And I said, whoever painted this picture knew about how the eye worked. The same geometry, the same, and of course, being on acid, the tanka turned into this giant diamond of crystal space with bubbles in it. The bubbles were like the Buddha, where the Buddhas were. And I'm like, oh my God, we have to find out what this is. I think it must have said Tibetan Tonka, and we never heard of anything like that. So guess what? He was a really important professor, but we jumped in his car and we immediately drove down to Harvard University to the Fogg Museum because his friend was the head of Asian studies. He looked at it and says, oh, that's Tibetan Buddhism. That's an ancient dead religion. There's no way you can find out anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> End of that story. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. <laughs> so then he said, now we're going to jump in the car again. And we drove to Washington, D.C., to the NIH, the National Institute of Health. He said, they must have stuff about this. So we looked through all the files. Sure enough, flicker fusion phenomena had been studied a little, but the scientists down there said, oh, this is subjective. We're scientists. We're only interested in the object. So move right along, go away, end of story. So my girlfriend and I, that was the end of that story. You know, we ended up hitchhiking across America, summer of love, Kate Ash, very grateful dead, as I said. And then uh, we got back to New York. Our life was very exciting because we were constantly meeting cool people. We were backstage at Woodstock with Playboy press passes and lots of stuff, but nothing was adding up. What was our life about, right? Um, until I threw the I Ching and we're on the road trip. We pick up Annabelle. I'm about to knock on the door. And, you know, as we arrived, the tail of the tiger, we were like, oh my God, this is like a hippie crash pad. This is a hippie commune. It was so run down. And there were burnt out cars on the front lawn. An old bathtub was in front of the door, a washing machine. It was horrible. We'd all had enough of that in the 60s. At any rate, I knock on the door and immediately it opens. And who is standing there but Fran Lewis, who recently passed away. She was the head of Tale of the Tiger. She had come with Trunka from Stanley Lynn. Total New York fabulous creature. And she looks at me and in her New York accent says, what do you do? And I said, well, I do art stuff. And she said, oh, come with me right away. Didn't say, who are you or anything. <laughs> so she leaves the photographer and the girlfriend at the door. She drags me through the first floor, which was filthy. There must have been 100 million black flies on the ceiling. There was mattresses everywhere. It was disgusting. But she takes me to a back little room. We open the door and there's this very small room, totally plain. And sitting there at a desk is what looks to me like an Oriental, an Asian hippie, a, like a young man about my age. I was in my 20s. And he has long hair and he's wearing a, an American Indian or Native American shirt with a geometric diagram on it. And he looks up to me and says, I've been waiting for you. And I'm like, what? What? Who are you? What's going on? Turns out he had just asked Fran to find someone that could draw, that could uh, help him with a project. And she was walking out the front door just as I knocked. That's why she said, what do you do? Come with me. 
Now in this room, there's only a simple square wooden table, two simple wooden chairs, a lamp, and on the table was a single blank piece of paper, a bottle of India ink, black ink, and then white typewriter corrections, a pen, a brush, a pencil, an eraser, and that was it. So it looked to me, being a good hippie, I said, oh my God, I've met the magician. See, he has a table and he has the four elements on it, the cup, the coin, the wand, and the sword. And he's holding something up. He's holding up a blank piece of paper, right? White paper. And I'm like, oh, I've met the magician. You know? And I had no idea who this person was. I knew he wasn't the Dalai Lama. There was no sign of anything, you know, Tibetan Buddhist here around at that point. It was Trump had only been there a few weeks in Vermont. And he said, he, yeah, so he said, you know, where have you been? Sit down, we have a project. And he immediately says, I want you to draw what's called a seed syllable, the letter A. And I'm like, never heard of this <laughs> stuff. But he picked up the pencil and he starts sketching it out. And as he sketches, he wants me to ink it in. Now this took a This is the ah. I had no idea what it was for, but we spent, must have been three hours drawing that ah, because he would make the most infinitesimal changes. For instance, he would say, Picture this ah uh, far away, like a, a block away, so you just get the essence. Now walk, walk towards it and imagine it fills all of space. Imagine that the top, you know, that little curve in, in the middle, so imagine that's 10,000 miles long and then reduce it to a dot again and expand it. So he's teaching me all these things and it just went on and on. And as we are talking, I mean, as we're doing this, I just jumped in. I had no idea we were planning on leaving for Canada in an hour or two. <laughs> and I start talking to him. And luckily, you know, I didn't know who he was, so I couldn't be intimidated. <laughs> so I start saying, where are you from? He says, Tibet. I'm like, oh my God, do you know about those things called tankas? And he says, yes, I do. Can you explain them to me? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, so I'm like, oh my God, do you also know about those grids you see in, in your eye? Do you know about that stuff? Yes, I do. Can you explain sacred geometry to me? Yes, I can. <laughs> you know, he was just going, yes. Then we start talking about everything. I'm like, can you explain Botticelli to me? Yes, and he does. Totally different than I thought. Uh, I would ask him questions like, why are girls so beautiful? <laughs> they don't have to be. People will still have babies. And he explained that whole thing to me, which had to do with chakras and balancing and glimpses of enlightenment. I don't, I never didn't know what that even meant, but I'm eating it up. I'm, he said, every question I ever had, I asked him, and he knew about it. He told me he discovered the I thing when he was a kid. He could pulse. I said, you didn't have electric fans. He said, no, I could pulse the blood through my eyelids and get that same flicker of fusion. And he said, all of Tibetan art is based on knowing this. I'm like, oh my God, I mean, this is the best thing that's ever happened. You know, everything, he explained geometry, uh, magic, and he told me so many stories that, so at the end, he said, what are your plans? And I said, well, we're driving to Canada. And he said, if you stay here, 
for a month, you can attend the next seminar, which is going to be on a poet called Milarepa. And I was that son. He said, I have a big project for you to do, and I want you to stay. So we, I went out dazed and found the, the photographer and my girlfriend, and, I, and the hitchhiker girl. And I said, look, I want to stay here. This guy, whoever he is, it, it's, you can't believe who he is. The photographer said, oh, he's no guru. It's, it's, gurus have long white beards and wear robes. And said, I'm leaving. I'm taking the car with me. You guys are stuck here for a month since we had traded our apartment. <laughs> so I'm like, fine. The girlfriend said, this place is a mess. So I'm going to help clean it up. The uh, hitchhiker girl said, oh, I'm a groupie and I was on my way to a concert. This is much more fun. <laughs> So Trunkler said, um, you know, just find a place to sleep. And uh, he said, tomorrow, my wife, who I met right away, she was 16. Can you believe Lady Diana was 16? She's flying back to Scotland, he said, to take care of some business. So find a place to sleep and then We'll start the, ne the day after tomorrow. So we go into the barn, the old barn, and there are all these horse stalls. And the horse in, in the barn, there are hay bales. Yeah, yeah. And so we all find different hay bales to sleep on. Very jolly good. You know, two days before I was in a big studio in New York wondering what to do with my life and now I'm gonna sleep on a hay bale. Now this is the start of weird things happening. I mean that was weird enough meeting Trunk Rinpoche who could answer every question I ever had as an art student. And the penny and the I Ching and my sister answering the phone. That was good enough but now just at sunrise this enormous blast of wind blows open the wooden shutter. And I see the sun coming through the window once again. In, in the middle of the sun, there's this little gray dot. The gray dot comes racing towards me through the window somehow. And you know, uh, the sun Yeah, I saw one of these giant Mexican heads, it's from the Olmec civilization that predates everything in Mexico. These things are like about 20 feet high. And I'd seen them at the Natural History Museum, with many of them. And it comes through the window and it looks just like Trungpa with the big lips and everything. And I, my girlfriend had woken up from the sheer blast of wind. And I said, you'll never guess what I just saw. And she says, well, you'll never get what I just saw. And we both saw the same vision of this giant Olmec head that looked just like Trumpa. We're like, okay, all right, this is, this is getting really good. Now, we have kind of a day off. So we're wandering around, Trump is attending to Lady Diana. And late in the afternoon, the photographer had left me one joint to smoke, <laughs> which I was dying to smoke, but I didn't know what the policy was going to be at this place. So I'm looking for a very secluded place to smoke my joint so I can think about all the stuff that's already happened in 24 hours. <laughs> so where the, the big shrine room is now, there used to be a sugar shack because they harvested maple syrup on the land in the old days. It was a dark brown wooden shack that had totally started to collapse. The roof was collapsed, the first floor was collapsed, and below it was a cellar. The cellar was filled with mud. Now I say, oh, this is the perfect place to smoke a joint. But once again, a beam of sunlight comes through the trees, it comes through the roof, 
It goes through the floorboards and it's, it focuses about a square foot of light on a rock. And on the rock, I see a bright piece of paper, brightly colored piece of paper. And being a little high already, I say, what is this? What could be down there? So I crawl down into the cellar, into the mud. I reach over and I grab the piece of paper. And what it was, was really ancient paper money from Tibet. Tibetan money in the cellar of the sugar shop. Now, of course, we all know that the Nagas put it there. Because if you walk into the shrine right now, and in between the four pillars in the center of the shrine room is where that piece of paper would have been. It was the seed. The Nagas were offering money to build a shrine in the future. <laughs> so I take it into Trungpa when I see him the next, and I said, look what I found. And he said, very nonchalant. He said, oh, that's worth about a hundred dollars. He's not surprised at all. He says, oh, that's really old Tibetan paper money. And I'm like, but, but, but. <laughs> 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 He's like, oh, now let's paint the door. <laughs> so, okay, so he said, now we have this project. We're going to go out and we're gonna paint this door. Now he said, do you know about the I Ching? And I said, yes, I do. I didn't, but I do. I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Compared to what he told me, I didn't know. <laughs> so he sends for his I Ching. He asks the secretary, go find my I Ching. And it's this very version that I learned the I Ching from as a hippie, the Wilhelm. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the Wilhelm I Ching. And he had, you know, he had no luggage. When Trungpa came to America, he had about $25 and they were living on cans of beans. He had nothing. He left in a hurry. <laughs> and um, so he said, look at the panels in the door. So, you know, leave this here. He said the panels in the door, I'll show it to you in a minute, spell out an I Ching. So we look it up and it's double joy, the joys, lake. So it's lake over lake. And he said, we're going to base what we're going to paint the door based on this I Ching. And I'm like, how did that happen? An old Vermont door has the I Ching. And he said, I'll tell you how to use the I Ching. He said, Number one, read the I Ching. Number two, memorize the I Ching. <laughs> Number three, throw the I Ching away. Because everywhere you look, there are hectograms, there are messages. He pointed to an ashtray and he told me what hectogram the cigarette butts were spelling out. <laughs> so then the door adventure starts. He said, first we have to repair the door. It was really weathered and tons of cracks in it. So we do that, that's me, painting the door. And he said, now after that took a while, a couple of days, sanding, sanding, sanding. Then we have to paint it white. You can still see some of the white there. And this went on for days of sanding and sanding sanding and more white, more white. He said, because it has to get to this point where you call it the magic mirror, when something is so white and smooth that instead of looking at it, you can look into it. You can go into the space. Now, at the same time, he had me prepare a canvas he said, you're going to paint a tanka. I, in that case, I used marble dust. So for a really long time, it felt like forever. All I'm doing is sanding. <laughs> but it was a week that was a gap before he started teaching the Miller Rapa ceremony. 
So Chungpa just sat on a chair for the whole week. And we just talked and talked and talked about stuff, you know? And uh, after he finally got it to the point where he called it like the magic mirror, he said the magic mirror contains, when you can look into space, it contains everything that ever was, is now, and will be in the future. And I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. <laughs> So he said, that's where ideas come from. You just have to create the magic mirror and then receive them. So we did that next stage was painting the solid color. You can see I'm doing the reddish to deep red. And you can see over there, there's a blue. Now, some colors we could buy enamel at the hardware store in St. John's there. Other colors were impossible to get right. And like one of the first colors was we needed a deep blue, like you can see sort of in that uh, panel. And the only, none of the deep blues in the hardware store worked. So we found an art store and it had a tube of lapis lazuli blue and oil paint, but it was very expensive. It was $10. So we bought it just to paint these little, he said it has to be the perfect color. The color has to be the richest color in that family, but it has, you have to be able to go into it. Not other colors come at you, they attack you, they're aggressive. So that prompted the first emergency meeting of the Tale of the Tiger administration. <laughs> How dare you spend $10 on a tube of paint for the two little panels when think of how many cans of beans that could have bought. And Trump have said the beans come and go, but this is going to live for a very long time. It was right about then that he started to explain to me that this is the portal for the Dharma to come in to the West. People will walk through the store, receive the Dharma, and then walk out the door and go out into the world and apply it. So fine. The next big problem for the solid colors, show the door now, uh, was the turquoise at the bottom of these pillars, down in the lower right and left. Now, we could not come up with any kind of turquoise to save our life. So the Millerapa Seminary, it started by now, and I'm going, I don't know what this stuff is, but it's really cool. It's like a continuous acid trip. Hearing about the Dharma, I'm like, this really makes sense to me. I love it. I love it. I love it. I don't care. So we're down at the tent one day. The talk ends in the late afternoon and we come back and there's a little girl, about 10 years old, and she's mixing paints on the doorstep. And she had poured oil paint, acrylic paint, plaster of Paris, anything she could find and she mixed it up. And it was the perfect turquoise. <laughs> Trunkla loved it. By then it was getting dark, so he said, get a bunch of cars and circle around the door and turn your headlights on <laughs> so we could trowel on this turquoise before it dried. It was such a bizarre mixture of paint. Anyway, that was the solid color. Then it came time to do the gold. So he explained to me the white was called Dharmakaya, the solid colors was Sambhokakaya. And the gold outline drawings are mnemonica. And of course, I'm just learning this term. Now, you can see uh, on the black pillar, there's an Avon, for instance. Uh, on the somewhere, there's double Georges and all these things, three flaming jewels. Of course, I there are no books on Tibetan Buddhism, so he would have to sketch them out for me, explain them and I would have to make stencils and paint them. And he would explain as we're doing the gold, 
you see in the middle of the door, like it makes these diamond shapes. And, you know, on the black pillar, there's diamond shapes, the negative space. And he's explaining to me the grids. And then there are the grids making like not of meditation designs. And then there are focal points like the A-bomb and uh, the jewels and different things. And he was explaining sacred geometry and, you know, focal points and grids, focal points and grids. Breathing in is focal points. Breathing out is grids. And as we're doing this, I'm just, it all makes sense to me. And I can't figure out why, why does all this, and why can I do it? Why, it all felt effortless to me, which really was strange. Uh, any rate, he's explaining to me, he said, you have to realize space is solid. It's like a diamond, it's like a crystal. And forms are like bubbles in space. I'm going, okay, okay. Uh, anyone that does mudra exercises <laughs> will know about this. Thank you, <laughs> Suzanne Duquette, for continuing this practice while so much of these teachings have been lost. But, you know, space is solid, it's crushing me, it's crushing me, oh, you know, I have to let go. So, <laughs> Suzanne knows this inside out. Um, and at any rate, at the end of the day, oh, then, um, here, show. Your tanka? Yeah, my tanka. You know, I'm like, the door is finished. Then we start on other projects, like the first shrine room. Now it's, you go up the stairs of Karma Chelling into the one with the slanted roofs. Is that like a Vajrayana shrine room now? Changes. You know, and yeah. so many funny stories with that. It was originally all old farm wood, you know, brown cracks with a crazy rug on it. And on the um, shrine, there was like a record player with a prayer wheel on <laughs> and spun around and it was all full of hippie stuff like teddy bears and seashells <laughs> and, you know my favorite rock <laughs> and when we came in and that summer in 1970 we cleared it all out um, people used to lean up against these posts we painted the beams red and blue really bright and trunk was swept um, oh, before this, we were like, we need a Buddha. So a tiny little Johannes Buddha. So I went to, to Barnett, another vision quest. How do you find a Buddha in Barnett in 1970? <laughs> well, it seemed there was a lawn sale going on right near Dick and Debbie. It was right near the post office. Is that little post office yeah. still there? Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. So right in front of the post office. And I find this plaster, you can see it or not. I'll get back to the painting. Plaster Buddha. Now that's not so magical, except if you look on the back, right here, it says 1939, made in the USA. Now 1939 is the year Trungpa was born. So I'm like, Okay, it's 25 cents sold. <laughs> so that was our little Buddha on the shrine until Trunka swept it all away, the crystal bowl, the bowls of water, and people hated it because they were hippies and they liked how cozy the old shrine room was. People would come in, do yoga, do eat their lunch, sleep. It was like a cozy hippie pad kind of shrine room. Suddenly it's this technicolor Tibetan Buddha's wake up shrine room. At any rate, I still have the Buddha he's on my shrine. And um, let's see, where is my, oh, let's go back to the Yeah, so all these little things happen. Oh, uh, another story. Um, oh, can, we, can we go and get those paintings? Mm -hmm. All sorts of activities went on during the rest of the day. For instance, 
we all would gather in Trungpa's room at the end of the day, and we would just do crazy stuff. He loved to do paintings, for instance. One day we're in there, people are walking in and out, and Trungpa did a bunch of paintings, and for some reason, I grabbed four of them and uh, took them home with me. I still have two. I sold one for a lot of money to go to Germany to start to work on the enthronement of the Sakyam and start Dharma art. I sold the other for a lot of money so I could go to Rocky Mountain Shambhala Center to start officially what is now called Shambhala art. So I kept these two. Now this one, for instance, Trungpa said, I saw an old paintbrush in the barn. Could you go and get it? And it was an old paintbrush that had dried. The oil paint had dried. So he got a pole from a broom. He tied the paintbrush to the pole, dipped it in ink and made this, I know it's backwards, but it, it looks like the beginning of an ashe. Then if you look carefully, he got down and painted colors in the empty gaps. And then he put a little man holding it up. <laughs> so, I, and then this one that I kept, one of the four, Trungpa did that big stroke of kind of pink ink. And he said, whoever walks in the room has to add to this picture. So I took the bowl of ink and I made the splash. Somebody else walked in and made that line. And then a girl walked in and walked across all the paintings and left footprints on this one. So Trungpa got down on his hands and knees and drew tiny little footprints uh, to <laughs> honor the occasion. So that was kind of like the first Dharma art group experience, right? So those kind of things went on. Uh, we we would gather in his bedroom in the morning um, and wait for him to wake up because he always had such cool stories to tell. One of them, he had a, a bagua like this, but it was a, a black mirror instead of silver mirror. And he would look in it and say, I, I am now traveling over the kingdom of Shambhala. Can you see it? And we're like, no. He said, look carefully. You can see we're over the rooftop. And he was like, look in the courtyard. The king is waving at us. <laughs> so he would tell us all these stories. Like he would say, he would say, what happened last night? And he would say, oh, last night I was put on the spot. I was sitting on a little cushion and I was surrounded by these very tall director's chairs. And each director chair had a king, a rigged in king, he said, in it. And they would ask me questions like, why are you there? What are you doing? He said, I was like a little schoolboy. <laughs> and he, they would say things like, why are you bothering with that third rate backwards, you know, in the middle of nowhere, planet Earth? It's so insignificant. So we said, what did you say? What did you say to the Rigdons? And he said, I told them earth girls are really pretty. <laughs> so, and at other times, they would just, so he would tell all these stories every morning. So that's some of the things that were also going on. Um, the kind of practices we did were uh, Kungadawa, Richard Arthur always led us right from the beginning in the Sadhana Mahamudra. So we would do that in the bedroom too. Trungpa at the time gave me a copy of his thesis at Oxford. He wrote it on the Bunri legend and I have it right here. And it's called The Golden Dot, The Epic of Law. So in 1970, I had this. <laughs> All right, so just endless, crazy, fun stuff, stories. Trungpa was always having so much fun. And from these little things, the whole kingdom grew effortlessly because I never saw Trungpa work. 
he was always enjoying himself. He loved having everybody around, hearing everyone's story, he had time for everyone. And as we know, everybody had their own experience of Trump. He appeared differently to every single mm -hmm. person. Everybody had these magic experiences. Mine are just common. Um, you know, he would control the weather. We asked him, how do you do that? <laughs> Uh, you know, you snap your fingers and it rains, or you snap your fingers and it stops raining, or it hails. So I, I was on a nice long walk with him in the country. I said, how do you do that? <laughs> he said, well, you could do that too, except you have one problem, Jack. He said, you think the weather and your mind are two separate things. <laughs> He said, if you realize they're both the same, it's really easy to control them. <laughs> okay, so we go back to New York after this is all done. And we're sitting there. We decide to call people from the New York area and have, have them come to our palatial studio. So there are about 10 or 15 people there, believe it or not. A lot of New Yorkers have showed up. Thanks to the Gurji, the Gurji people put the word out. And a lot of early students were Gurji students. So we're sitting in, and we're going to have the first Dharma meeting in the West, <laughs> first Sangha thing. And basically, all we did was sit around and go, what the hell was that? <laughs> oh my God, WTF. <laughs> What in the world? Who is that guy? What? There's no books on this stuff. We knew about Zen and Hinduism, but this was different. So that was that. Then in December, Trungpa was having another get together at Tail. So a bunch in just before Christmas. So a bunch of us got a car and went up there. Going, you know, because we were just like, what, what? You know, we didn't know if he was going to stick around or disappear into the clouds. Or <laughs> we knew he was this magical being um, that we all loved. And uh, he was going to give a talk. Now, at the time, it was on the first floor in the living room. There was only about 10 or 15 people, I recall, there. And the first day, there was a big fish tank. And he was sitting in a big chair, and we were all on the ground, sitting on the floor. And he said, last night, I read The Little Prince. Don't have to, I'm sure everyone knows this book. <laughs> and he said, I am now going to tell you a fairy tale that sums up the entire Buddhist path called The Castle of Ego. And there it is. I took notes and other people did. And we uh, wrote it down as best we could. And when he read this story to us, I totally fell in love. Because I love fairy tales and stories rather than big uh, ponderous books on the Dharma, <laughs> which there weren't any anywhere. Except Herbert Gunther, go try that on. So that brings me up to Christmas 1970, where I'm supposed to stop, but I have a few things to add. <laughs> and I want to add that many years later, we had a theater company in the New York Shambhala Center. It was called Gesture, um, Great Eastern Sun Theatrical Ultimate Reality Explosion. And David Parin ran it, really fun. He did a fantastic job. And we were trying to develop our own plays. And I said, let me run this meeting. And I'm going to read the story. Nobody's ever heard it. It's called The Castle of Ego. And there's, I said, could somebody volunteer to act it out as I read it? It's about the rainbow chart. And it really has the entire body on the path as a fairy tale. So this hand pops up, and it's Miss Alice and Pepper. <laughs> and I'm like, 
I had been working on a play that was going to be about Tara anyway, but I hadn't discussed that with people. Allison raises her hand and jumped right in and she nails it. <laughs> and as she's leaving, I said, this is her first time there. Um, she was brand new, just checking it out, saw it on the web. And uh, I stop her at the elevator and in true theatrical uh, lore, I say, wait, I have a play I'm writing. It's about Tara. I want you to be the star. And she says, yes, Allison has been the star ever since <laughs> to this day. Uh, and um, so that's the end of these kind of stories. But I want to add one more thing. I told you what Trump has said to me first, which is, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> then. Chunkla, the magic stuff kept going, kept going. Um, one day, I was in New Jersey and my mother was dying. Very long, gruesome, uh, hard experience. Death brings out the worst in everyone. <laughs> so I say to my family, okay, I've got to take a break, go back to New York. Um, change my clothes, chill for a minute, and then I'll be back. And the girlfriend was in Europe because Trump had given me another magic formula to turn her into the top fashion model in the world, highest paid. So she was away. I get back to New York for a big glass of sake, and I start to do one of these tiny little paintings I used to do of Greek goddesses. It was my version of voodoo to keep my girlfriend as the top model. By then it had been many years. She stayed that way for about 20 years by doing the voodoo things. I only showed these pictures to Trunkla and her. At any rate, the phone rings. I'm back about, oh, half an hour. And it's Trunkla on the line. And he said, I understand your mother just died. And I'm like, but I haven't called anybody. I'm in New Jersey. But things like this happened all the time. And he said, I have something to tell you. What? He said, your mother was the bus. Now, that was a punchline to a situation I told him about in 1971 and never mentioned it since. It was hilariously funny to me. Then he says, what are you doing? And I said, one of the little watercolors. He said, don't forget to make it big, make it happen on a big scale. It already was. Mm -hmm. um, and then he his voice changed. And he said, and this is the final words he spoke to me. He said, Jack, in order to change the world, you have to change the culture. In order to change the culture, you have to change the art. In order to change the art, you have to change how art is taught. Therefore, you need to teach Dharma art, especially to young girls, because they will rule the world. And then he hung up the phone. Subsequently, I saw him in Halifax when I was putting the final touches on the opening of the shrine, but he wasn't speaking. He was just using sign language. So everyone, that's my talk. I hope it was amusing. I have 50 more years of story, <laughs> if you have a chance. Oh yeah, here's the Castle of Ego. And then, uh, and then we're gonna do some Q and A. Okay, so. How long did that take? Okay, that was good, 45 minutes. Less, yeah, 40 minutes. Okay. That was brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> I love you for that. Who's this speaking? Uh, Melissa, we don't know each other, but oh. that was totally brilliant. I thank you so much. I would love to meet you. <laughs> Just because Okay, I'm... we'll meet. Yeah, you know. I'm really, uh, I'm quarantined in my apartment due to ill health and the pandemic. So yeah. it's very hard for me to go anywhere. Oh, well, I can come to New York. 
Yeah, and um, I'm a poet. We should talk. The first visitor I've had in three months. <laughs> what in three months? The first visitor I've had to my apartment in three months. Oh, okay. That I'll I'll come to New York. Yeah. Anybody else? I'd love to meet anybody that's interested in these things. There's so much more to it. It's beyond belief. So, any you have a question? No, I just want to say hi. It's Jenny. Oh, I haven't Please. seen you for a long time. Hi, Jenny. Jenny. Jenny Warg, oh my God, how yeah. are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm getting are... on, but uh, I just so much enjoyed your talk. I was completely... Thanks. Jenny, where are you? I didn't know all these things. I sort of sucked up your atmosphere, but I didn't know the details. And yeah. I'd love to hear yeah. more about Sarah, too, if you ever get a chance to talk about it. Your girlfriend. Okay. Ask Sorry. Me now. Ask me now. Where are you living? I'm in Bellingham, Washington, just north of Seattle. Oh. Have you been out here? Huh? You should come out here sometime. Yeah, a good friend just moved out there. Oh, good. Um, You'll have to come. On. Yeah. Um, so wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see you too. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else want to say hello? Thanks, Jack. <laughs> uh, I guess what? We'll, go ahead. Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. Hi. Barbara and I are talking at the same time. <laughs> yes, we're talking at the same time. <laughs> we're New Yorkers. So we all talk at the same time. <laughs> we all want Thank to say you, hello. Thank <laughs> you all love. So I miss cool. you all. So great to see everybody here. So Brings tears to my eyes. But oh yeah, I wanted to say, I realized as I was preparing this that my interest in Chankla is how he manifested his world, how he created this vast kingdom in so short a time. And it has to do with this kind of magical approach. Um, for instance, we were designing things at the Snow Lion Inn, and I designed a Tory gate for him. And he said, can you visualize it? And I said, I just drew it in front of you. And he said, if you can visualize it, it will be there in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's how he worked. He could visualize everything so precisely that things like Naropa University, Gampo Abbey, Tail the Tiger, all these things just appeared because he could visualize. Of course, he had the help of all the gods and goddesses and the drawers and the wermas and the nagas and everybody else. So that, you know, I, I'm not a good student. I did all the things you're supposed to, but I don't like to read books. And I'm not a but, good but Jack, but Jack, you got, you like got the original download. That's why it's yeah. so great to hear this and feel this from you because you just really, you just showed up and took hey, it, Barbara. you know? Yeah, yeah. so thank Hi, you. Barbara. I love your chronicles that you sent out, your pictures, <laughs> your diaries. My <laughs> diaries. Uh, yeah, it's great to see you. Everybody soon, but congratulations on keeping that tradition going. Mm one of the few people that keeps the Dharma art tradition going, beside Miss Duquette. <laughs> uh, who else is there? Jack, thank you for keeping the tradition going. <laughs> you're bringing the magic forward. That's what you're doing. And that's, that's what we need. Thank you so much. Um, so much. Ty, I see Ty up there. Uh. Ty. Ty is one of my new friends, fairly new, and I uh, try to pronounce her last name. I can't do it. So. Jack, thank you. This was amazing. And Ty is like a good, she wanted to learn all about this Dharma art stuff, so we've become friends. And I miss seeing her a lot, but we will. So thank you for being online, Ty. Um, anybody else? Robert. Chudge Who's that there. person up Robert. there? Hey, Robert. Hey, Jack. It's Ellen from New York. How are you? 
All right. Are we are still in New York? Still in New York. And just thinking about 1980, we did Ikebana together with Marsha Shibata. Yeah. And we'll never forget that moment when you and Sarah became heaven and earth. And she's <laughs> lying on the floor and you're standing above her. It brings back this incredibly magical moment. It was my first time at Karma Tolling and I'll never forget it. It was just magic. It seems like it was yesterday. It was. <laughs> yeah. So just sending you all so much love. I miss you all so much. It's so great to see you all. Okay. Who's that? Oh, Jenny. Yeah. Ellen, you're living in the city? No, I live on Long Island. Oh, okay. Well, nice. It's wonderful to see you. Yeah, it'll be nice to connect again. Okay. Uh, we have lots of plans to get something crazy going on. And, you know, originally, <laughs> this is all new, this Skypey, Zoomy stuff, and the things you can do with it. <laughs> well, who knows what the future will bring? Hey, Jack. Yeah. Bob here. Oh, Bob. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I love about uh, learning this kind of dynamic of uh, Dharma art is how personal it is. It's just as personal as a, a flicker through the sky that only you notice. And yet, that's, it's like uh, Trungpa says, you look at a circle and then suddenly there will appear a dot. Yeah. <laughs> you go into the dot. That, act, that actually, I tried it out. And I was astounded at it actually. No, we, all thought we were his best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced I was his best friend, but so was everybody else. <laughs> so he had lots of room for all of us. And yeah. You're differently to everybody, you know. This is how he manifested to me. And I love joining in. Cannot imagine what would have happened if that little shiny penny wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the hey. other all these coincidences. I put in a vote for a, that you do a part two, Jack. <laughs> well, one of these days. How about yeah. part 50? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stories. And the story yeah, yeah. crazier and more and more magical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more stories. And they're still going on. Because, you know, the rumor of Trungpa's death is, you know, just. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. Okay, so um, I think I've hit my limit. It's one hour, almost an hour. Coming in on time, prepared. <laughs> Who's the KCL manager there? I mean, we're in no hurry, Jack, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, not, so. I didn't want any more. <laughs> Uh, why don't we sign out? I hear the uh, celebration is really great. Jenny's been trying to get a hold of people. Oh. Huh? Jenny Warwick. Oh, yeah? Can't hear you. Unmute, Jenny, unmute. Un this yeah. is about the I Ching. Yeah. And um, I threw it just before this event started. And um, Believe it or not, I threw the joyous lake. So <laughs> playing the door at Karma Choling, it just was fantastic. It was just like another one of those moments that yeah, you got it. full in your life that uh, that filled me up. So I was very happy to hear about that story. Proof, proof. <laughs> uh, proof. With no changing lines. Hi, Jack. Uh, it's Cynthia uh, from California. I just wanted to say hello. We worked on Hi. Dharma Art together, you know, in LA and San Francisco a bit with Rinpoche when he did the installations and stuff. Oh, yeah. My Some time ago. But yeah. that was wonderful today. Thanks so much. It's well, just... Thank you for showing up. Oh, you're lucky you saw those installations. What were you at the water in LA? Yeah. Or San Francisco? Yeah, yeah. Explorers of the Phenomenal World, right? Oh, yeah, that was the name of the group. The Explorers yeah. of the Richness and Beauty of <laughs> the Phenomenal <There> World. <laughs> anyway, let's get back in touch, but uh, it's been wonderful. So. Thank you. Okay. Very good for me. I've been so isolated. So. Well, now you're not anymore.
Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank I you. Think, uh, celebration is really wonderful. I wanted to uh, have a shout out. For the 40th anniversary, Allison and I, does anybody remember? Uh, can you see? Yeah. Samanti. <laughs> I told her I'd show her a picture. <laughs> She's still my girlfriend. <laughs> Um, uh, we put on plays of Carmen Chilling, two of Trung Pung's plays. After the capital of Vigo, he started writing all these plays, which are really crazy and surrealistic. And we, I made 50 banners and taught classes and we, we did everything. Allison was the star of the plays as always. <laughs> and actually we put on the capital of Vigo, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Mm -hmm like a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> yes. And uh, it was so nice. That's the last time I was there, 10 years ago. But we had a blast. Um, Judy Bond was there with us and uh, Allison and Samanti. I mentioned your name, sweetheart. <laughs> so there you go. I just wanted to say and here it is 50. There's, so, there's Congratulations, everybody. I saw pictures of the, what was it called? The absurdly formal feast. <laughs> hey, Jack, you got, you got Judy Rosen to run up the stairs in our house. That never happens. Well, this is, this is uh, Alex DeVarin. Uh, you knew me as Gus, and we wanted to show, this is your design for the- yeah. DeVarin? Oh. Yeah, Gus DeVarin. This is the 20th, right? 25th. 25th. This is the 25th anniversary t-shirt you made. Yeah. So is your brother Alex? No, Alex is Gus. It's the same one. <laughs> same person. And uh, Jude, Jude is here. You remember Judy Robeson? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, Judy. Yeah. Hi. And uh, we Hi, treasure Alex. these, you know, I, for about five years, I slept in this shirt every single night. <laughs> it was my, it was my uh, night shirt. And what is it? <laughs> It's 20th, right? Because it's 25th. No, it's 20th because it's 1970 and 1990. Yeah, yeah. That one, right. I did, oh, I, there's a whole story behind that. <laughs> yeah, um, no, there must have been a 25th. Too. That's been 20th. So you right. silk screened these, right? Yeah. We have a whole line of deity t shirts. Feel free to order them. <laughs> 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 Thanks to Samanti and uh, Alice and his help. We're still on the t-shirt <laughs> um, Still writing plays, making books, doing all sorts of projects, it all going. So have a wonderful celebration, everybody. Wish I was there, but I can't walk. <laughs> wow. I'll pass it back to you, JT. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you, Jack. Thank you Thank you. so much. Yeah. Love great to everybody. stuff. Love to everyone. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to leave the room open for just a few minutes after we formally close out. So if you want to keep chatting and connecting, please do. Don't let this vibe go. I just have a couple quick things to throw in to formally close this, and, uh, and then I'll get out of your way. Uh, Jack, first of all, wow. Um, this is truly going to be one of the highlights of this whole event. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, but an incredibly precious document for our archives for uh, forever. So thank you so much uh, to you. Uh, and also, I just want to quickly thank uh, Allison and Ty Pimpakar for helping organize tonight. This was just a, a fantastic evening. The, karma the current karma trolling household uh, is completely blown away. And I know you all are too. Um, you know, we, we do have a couple more days of, of events happening online, uh, including uh, you know, more chances to connect like this over different subjects. So please come, you know, check the schedule on the website, you know, register for things, show up for practices. Uh, we'll conclude it on Tuesday with a big bonfire and aspirations for the next 50 years, or well, maybe a small bonfire. Um, and consider also uh, checking out the raffle, the wish list, all the things that we do for 
the birthday um, and uh, just you know, stay in touch and be with us, everybody. We, Karma Trolling is doing well and we continue to be absolutely blessed by the contributions of people like Jack Nyland. Every time we open the Dharma door, every time we put on one of our t-shirts, every time anything creative or crazy or magical happens around here, we know we are a part of a long lineage and a legacy uh, of Dharma art and it's because of folks like Jack. So thank you all very much. I'd like to bow to y'all and, and if we could bow to each other and then I'll just leave this room open and you can chat, reminisce, yak, make some magic happen here on Zoom, all right? All right, thank you all for joining. Have a good night. I'm going to disappear and the room is yours.